Book Six, Canto Six, The Legend of Calidore. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Morgan Scorpion. The Fairy Queen by Edmund Spencer. Book Six, The Legend of Calidore. Canto Six. The hermit heals both squire and dame of their sore maladies. He turpine doth defeat and shame for his late villainies. No wound which warlike hand of enemy inflicts with dint of sword, so sore doth light as doth the poisonous sting which infamy infixeth in the name of noble wight. For by no art nor any leeches might it ever can recured be again nor all the skill which that immortal sprite of Podolirius did in it retain. Can remedy such hurts, such hurts are hellish pain. Such were the wounds the which that blatant beast made in the bodies of that squire and dame, and being such were now much more increased for want of taking heed unto the same, that now corrupt and cureless they became. How be that careful hermit did his best, with many kinds of medicines meet, to tame the poisonous humour, which did most infest their rankling wounds, and every day them duly dressed. For he right well in leech's craft was seen, and through the long experience of his days, which had in many fortunes tossed been, and passed through many perilous assays, he knew the diverse went of mortal ways, and in the minds of men had great insight with which sage counsel when they went astray he could inform and them reduce aright and all the passions heal which wound the weaker sprite for while on he had been a doughty knight as any one that lived in his days and proved oft in many perilous fight of which he grace and glory won always and in all battles bore away the bays but being now attached with timely age and weary of this world's unquiet ways, he took himself unto this hermitage, in which he lived alone, like careless bird in cage. One day, as he was searching of their wounds, he found that they had festered privily, and rankling inward with unruly stands, the inner part now gan to putrefy, that quite they seemed past the help of surgery, and rather needed to be disciplined with wholesome reed of sad sobriety, to rule the stubborn rage of passion blind, Give salves to every sore, but counsel to the mind. So taking them apart into his cell, He to that point fit speeches gan to frame, As he the art of words knew wondrous well, And eke could do as well as say the same. And thus he to them said, Fair daughter dame, and you fair son, Which here thus long now lie in piteous languor, Since ye hither came, in vain of me ye hope for remedy, and I likewise in vain do salves to you apply. For in yourself your only help doth lie, to heal yourselves, and must proceed alone from your own will to cure your malady. Who can him cure that will be cured of none? If therefore health ye seek, observe this one. First learn your outward senses to refrain from things that stir up frail affection. Your eyes, your ears, your tongue, your talk restrain from that they most affect, and in due terms contain. For from these outward senses ill affected, the seed of all this evil first doth spring, which at the first before it had infected, mote easy be suppressed with little thing. But being grown strong, it forth doth bring sorrow, and anguish, and impatient pain in the inner parts, and lastly, scattering contagious poison close through every vein, it never rests, till it have wrought his final bane. For that beast's teeth which wounded you to four are so exceeding venomous and keen, made all of rusty iron, rankling sore, that where they bite it booteth not to wean with salve, or antidote, or other mean, it ever to amend, no marvel aught, for that same beast was bred of hellish strain, and long in darksome Stygian den upbrought, begot of foul echidna, as in books is taught. Echidna is a monster, direful dread, Whom gods do hate, and heavens abhor to see. 
So hideous in her shape, so huge her head, That even the hellish fiends affrighted be At sight thereof, and from her presence flee. Yet did her face and former parts profess A fair young maiden, full of comely glee, But all her hinder parts did plain express A monstrous dragon, full of fearful ugliness. To hear the gods, for her so dreadful face in fearful darkness furthest from the sky, and from the earth appointed have her place, mongst rocks and caves, where she enrolled doth lie in hideous horror and obscurity, wasting the strength of her immortal age. There did Typhaon with her company, cruel Typhaon, whose tempestuous rage makes the heavens tremble oft, and him with vows assuage. Of that commixtion they did then beget, this hellish dog that hight the blatant beast, a wicked monster, that his tongue doth wet gainst all, both good and bad, both most and least, and pours his poisonous gull forth to infest the noblest whites with notable defame. Nor ever knight that bore so lofty crest, nor ever lady of so honest name, but he them spotted with reproach or secret shame. In vain, therefore, it were with medicine to go about to salve such kind of sore, that rather needs wise read and discipline than outward salves, that may augment it more. I me, said then Serena, sighing sore, what hope of help doth then for us remain, if that no salves may us to health restore? But sith we need good counsel, said the swain, a read, good sire, some counsel that may us sustain. The best, said he, that I can you advise, is to avoid the occasion of the ill, for when the cause whence evil doth arise, remove it is, the effects are ceaseth still. Abstain from pleasure, and restrain your will. Subdue desire, and bridle loose delight. Use scanted diet, and forbear your fill. Shun secrecy, and talk in open sight. So shall you soon repair your present evil plight. Thus having said, his sickly patience did gladly hearken to his grave behist and kept so well his wise commandments, that in short space their malady was ceased, and eke the biting of that harmful beast was thoroughly healed. Though when they did perceive their wounds were cured, and forces re-increased, of that good hermit they both took their leave, and went both on their way, now each would other leave. But each the other vowed to company. The lady, for that she was much in dread, now left alone in great extremity, the squire, for that he courteous was indeed, would not her leave alone in her great need, so both together travelled, till they met with a fair maiden clad in mourning weed, upon a mangy jed unmeetly set, and a lewd fool her leading through dry and wet. But by what means that shame to her befell, and how thereof herself she did acquite, I must a while forbear to you to tell, Till that, as comes by course, I do recite What fortune to the Briton prince did light, Pursuing that proud knight, The which while here wrought to Sir Calidore So foul despite. And eke his lady, though she sickly were, So lewdly had abused, as ye did lately hear. The prince, according to the former token Which fair Serene to him delivered had, Pursued him straight, in mind to be eroken Of all the vile demean and usage bad, With which he had those two so ill bestad. No wight with him on that adventure went, But that wild man, whom though he oft forbade, Yet for no bidding, nor for being shent, Would he restrained be from his attendment. Arriving there, as did by chance befall, He found the gate wide open, and in he rode, No stayed till that he came into the hall, where soft dismounting, like a weary load, Upon the ground with feeble feet he trod, As he unable were for very need, To move one foot, but there must make abode. The whiles the salvage man did take his steed, And in some stable near, did set him up to feed. Ere long to him a homely groom there came, That in rude wise him asked what he was, That durst so boldly, without let or shame, Into his lord's forbidden hall to pass. To whom the prince, him feigning to embase, mild answer made. He was an errant knight, the which was fallen into this feeble case, Through many wounds which lately he in fight received had, And prayed to pity his ill plight. But he, 
the more outrageous and bold, sternly did bid him quickly thence avaunt, or dear aby, for why his lord of old did hate all errant knights which there did haunt, nor lodging would to any of them grant, and therefore lightly bade him pack away, not sparing him with bitter words to taunt, and therewithal rude hand on him did lay, to thrust him out of door, doing his worst assay. But when the salvage, coming now in place, beheld, eftsoons he all enraged grew, and running straight upon that villain base, like a fell lion at him fiercely flew, and with his teeth and nails in present view him rudely rent, and all to pieces tore, so miserably him all helpless slew, that with the noise, whilst he did loudly roar, the people of the house rose forth in great uproar. Who when on ground they saw their fellows slain, and that same knight and salvage standing by, upon them too they fell with might and main, and on them laid so huge and horribly, as if they would have slain them presently. But the bold prince defended him so well, and their assault withstood so mightily, that maugre all their might he did repel, and beat them back, whilst many underneath him fell. Yet he them still so sharply did pursue, that few of them he left alive, which fled, those evil tidings to their lord to show, who hearing how his people badly sped, came forth in hast, where when, as with the dead, he saw the ground all strode, and that same night, and salvage with their blood fresh steaming red, he walks and nigh mad, with wrath and fell despite, and with reproachful words him thus bespake on height. Art thou he, traitor, that with treason vile hast slain my men in this unmanly manner, and now triumphest in the piteous spoil of these poor folk, whose souls with black dishonour and foul defame do deck thy bloody banner? The meed whereof shall shortly be thy shame, and wretched end, which still attendeth on her. With that himself to battle he did frame, so did his forty yeomen, which there with him came. With dreadful force they all did him assail, and round about with boisterous strokes oppress, that on his shield did rattle like to hail in a great tempest, that in such distress he wist not to which side him to address, and evermore that craven coward knight was at his back with heartless heediness, waiting if he unawares him murther might, for cowardice does still in villainy delight. Whereof, when as the prince was well aware, he to him turned with furious intent, and him against his power gan to prepare like a fierce bull, that being busy bent to fight with many foes about him meant, feeling some cur behind his heels to bite, turns him about with fell avengement, so likewise turned the prince upon the knight, and laid at him amain with all his will and might, who when he once his dreadful strokes had tasted, durst not the fury of his force abide, but turned aback, and to retire him hasted, through the thick press, there thinking him to hide. But when the prince had once him plainly eyed, he foot by foot him followed alway. Nor would him suffer once to shrink aside, but joining close, huge load at him did lay, who flying still did ward, and warding fly away. But when his foe he still so eager saw, unto his heels himself he did betake, hoping unto some refuge to withdraw, nor would the prince him ever foot forsake. Where so he went, but after him did make. He fled from room to room, from place to place, Whilst every joint for dread of death did quake, Still looking after him, that did him chase, That made him evermore increase his speedy pace. At last he up unto the chamber came, Whereas his love was sitting all alone, Waiting what tidings of her folk became. There did the prince him overtake anon, Crying in vain to her, him to bemoan, and with his sword him on his head did smite, That to the ground he fell in senseless swoon, Yet whether thwart or flatly it did light, The tempered steel did not into his brain-pan bite. Which, when the lady saw, with great affright, She starting up, began to shriek aloud, And with her garment covering him from sight, Seemed under her protection him to shroud, And falling lowly at his feet, Her bowed upon her knee, entreating him for grace, and often him besought, and prayed, and vowed, That with the ruth of her so wretched case He stayed his second stroke, and did his hand abase. Her weed she then withdrawing, 
did him discover, who now come to himself yet would not rise, but still did lie as dead and quake and quiver, that even the prince his baseness did despise, and eke his dame him seeing in such guise gan him recomfort and from ground to rear, who rising up at last in ghastly wise, like troubled ghosts did dreadfully appear, as one that had no life him left through former fear. Whom when the prince so deadly saw dismayed, he for such baseness shamefully him shent, and with sharp words did bitterly upbraid. Vile coward dog, now do I much repent that ever I this life unto thee lent, whereof thou caitiff so unworthy art, that both thy love for lack of hardiment, and eke thyself for want of manly heart, and eke all knights hast shamed with this knightless part. Yet further hast thou heaped shame to shame, and crime to crime by this thy coward fear. For first it was to thee reproachful blame to erect this wicked custom, which I hear, gainst errant knights and ladies thou dost rear, whom when thou mayst thou dost of arms despoil, or of their upper garment which they wear, yet doest thou not with manhood, but with guile maintain this evil use, thy foes thereby to foil. And lastly, in approvance of thy wrong, to show such faintness and foul cowardice, is great shame. For oft it falls, that strong and valiant knights do rashly enterprise, either for fame or else for exercise, a wrongful quarrel to maintain by fight, yet have, through prowess and their brave emprise, gotten great worship in this world as sight, for greater force there needs to maintain wrong than right. Yet since thy life unto this lady fair I given have, live in reproach and scorn, nor ever arms, nor ever knighthood dare, hence to profess, for shame it is to adorn with so brave badges one so basely born, but only breathe, since that I did forgive, so having from his craven body torn those goodly arms, he them away did give, and only suffered him this wretched life to live. There whilst he thus was settling things above, atween the lady mild and recreant knight, to whom his life he granted for her love, he gan bethink him in what perilous plight he had behind him left that salvage white amongst so many foes, whom sure he thought by this quite slain in so unequal fight. Therefore descending back in haste he sought if yet he were alive, or to destruction brought. There he found him environed about with slaughtered bodies, which his hand had slain, and laying yet afresh with courage stout upon the rest that did alive remain, whom he likewise right sorely did constrain like scattered sheep, to seek for safety. After he gotten had with busy pain some of their weapons, which thereby did lie, with which he laid about, and made them fast to fly, whom when the prince so felly saw to rage, approaching to him near his hand he stayed, and sought by making signs him to assuage, whom them perceiving, straight to him obeyed, as to his lord, and down his weapons laid, as if he long had to his heasts been trained. Thence he him brought away, and up conveyed into the chamber, where that dame remained with her unworthy knight, who ill him entertained whom when the salvage saw from danger free, sitting beside his lady there at ease, he well remembered that the same was he which lately sought his lord for to displease, though all in rage he on him straight did seize, as if he would in pieces him have rent, and were not that the prince did him appease, he had not left one limb of him unrent, but straight he held his hand at his commandment. Thus having all things well in peace ordained, the prince himself there all that night did rest, where him Blandina fairly entertained with all the courteous glee and goodly feast, the which for him she could imagine best. For well she knew the ways to win good will of every wight, that were not to infest, and how to please the minds of good and ill, through tempering of her words and looks by wondrous skill. Yet were her words and looks but false and feigned, to some head end to make more easy way, or to allure such fondlings whom she trained into her trap unto their own decay. Thereto, when needed, she could weep and pray, and when her listed she could fawn and flatter, now smiling smoothly like to summer's day, now glooming sadly, so to cloak her matter. Yet were her words but wind, and all her tears but water. Whether such grace were given her by kind, 
as women want their guileful wits to guide, or learned the art to please, I do not find. This well I wot, that she so well applied her pleasing tongue, that soon she pacified the wrathful prince, and wrought her husband's peace, who natheless not therewith satisfied, his rancorous despite did not release, nor secretly from thought of fell revenge surcease. For all that night the whiles the prince did rest in careless couch, not weeting what was meant, he watched in closer wait with weapons pressed, willing to work his villainous intent on him that had so shamefully him shent, yet durst he not for very cowardice effect the same, whilst all the night was spent, the morrow next the prince did early rise, and passeth forth to follow his first enterprise. End of Canto Six, Book Six, The Legend of Calidore.